military tribunal convened in final session. Every chair in the courtroom was occupied except the 21 chairs in the prisoner's dock. The four judges and their alternates sat at the bench. Defense counsel faced them across the room. To the left were the four tables of the prosecution staff. I sat at the American prosecution table. Behind us, members of the press and guests packed the visitor's gallery. The defendants were to be brought into the courtroom one at a time to hear the sentences pronounced against them. At ten minutes before three, the panel door on the back of the prisoner's dock slid silently open. The defendant, Herman Gehrig, stepped out of the elevator, which had brought him from the ground floor, where the defendants waited. Gehrig put on a set of headphones, which had been handed to him by one of the white helmeted American guards. The president of the tribunal began to speak. Gehrig signaled that he was unable to hear it through the headphones, and there was an awkward delay while the technician sought to correct the difficulty. A new set of headphones was produced, and once again, Gary quietly awaited the words which were to decide his fate. Defendant Herman Wilhelm Gary, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the International Military Tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. The number two Nazi turned on his heel and passed through the panel door into the waiting elevator. The door closed and there was a hum of whispered voices in the courtroom as those present awaited the arrival of the next defendant, Rudolf Hess. Hess, who had flown his Messerschmitt to England in a futile effort to persuade the British to abandon the fight with Germany, was sentenced to imprisonment for life. The other defendants appeared in turn and received their sentences, 12, including Martin Bormann, who had been tried in absentia, and my defendant, Ernst Kotterberg, received death sentences. Uh, three, Hans Fritschi, Homer Schott, and Franz von Papen were acquitted, and the remaining seven were given terms of imprisonment. After delivering the sentences, the, tri the tribunal adjourned, city died. I had been appointed by Justice Jackson as his personal representative at the executions and was present in the Palace of Justice on the fateful night of October 15, 16, 1946. Shortly after midnight, the electrifying word was released that Gehring had cheated the hangman by taking poison while lying ostensibly asleep upon the bed in his cell. Death thus came to Gehring by his own hand as it had come to Hitler, Hitler and girls before him. Even as the prison officer was walking to the cell block to give formal notice of the executions to take place of that night. At 11 minutes past one o'clock in the morning of October 16, the white-faced former foreign minister Joaquin von Ribbentrop stepped through the door into the execution chamber and faced the gallery on which he and the others condemned to die by the tribunal were to be hanged. His hands were unmanacled and bound behind him with a leather thong. Ribbentrop walked to the foot of the 13 steps leading to the gallows platform. He was asked to state his name and answered, Joaquin von Ribbentrop. Flanked by two guards and followed by the chaplain, he slowly mounted the stairs. On the platform, he saw the hangman with a noose of 13 coils and the hangman's assistant with a black book. He stood on the track and his feet were bound with a web army belt. Asked to state any last words, he said, God protect Germany, God have mercy on my soul. My last wish is that German unity be maintained, that understanding between East and West be realized, and there be peace for the world. The trap was sprung, and Ribbentrop died at 1.29. In the same way, each of the remaining defendants approached the scaffold and met the fate of common criminals. All, except the wordy Nazi philosopher Rosenberg, uttered final statements. After the executions, 
The body of each man was placed upon a simple wooden coffin. A tag with the name of the deceased was pinned to coat, shirt, or sweater. With a hangman's noose still about his neck, each hangman was photographed. The body of Herman Gary was brought in and placed upon its box to be photographed with the others. In the early morning hours, two trucks carrying the eleven caskets left the prison compound at the Palace of Justice bound for Dachau concentration camp near Munich. There, during all of that day, the bodies were burned in the ovens, which had formerly been used for the victims of Nazism. In the evening, the eleven urns containing the ashes of the Nuremberg defendants were taken away to be emptied into the river we saw. The dust of the dead was carried along in the currents of the stream to the Danube and thence to the sea. Thus ended the Hitler tyranny. The tyrant and his chief cohorts were gone. They had sought to achieve greatness in history, but they inscribed their names in sand and clean waters fell upon the beach and washed them out. They had intended to establish a new order for Europe, but they built upon pillars of hate, and what they stood for could not stand. The Third Reich of Germany, promised by Adolf Hitler to last a thousand years, was destroyed because of him in twelve years. Hitler led Germany into the abyss, and the people of Germany followed him, believing and enchanted, until the end. In his brief hour upon history's stage, he caused the commission of crimes of the greatest magnitude ever endured by suffering humanity. By their own misery, the German people came to know the penalty of following a false prophet. But false prophets have arisen in other lands. Apologists for the Hitler regime may someday be heard from, challenging truths which in the absence of positive proofs might successfully be denied. Fortunately, for history's sake and for the sake too of many men of many lands who gave their lives to right the wrongs of Hitler's Germany, the proofs are permanently of record in the proceedings of the Nuremberg trial. The defendants were selected primarily as top leaders in the Nazi regime, essentially without regard to matters of proof. But even before the case was brought to trial on November 20, 1945, with stirring speeches by the chief prosecutors, trial counsel were painfully aware of the fact that we were facing a monumental task of finding the evidence to convict the 22 defendants, individual defendants, and the seven organizations on trial before the tribunal. Colonel Robert G. Story was Justice Jackson's executive trial counsel. Before the trial began, he established contact with the American Expeditionary Forces in Paris, from which he obtained a large volume of incriminating German documents. While I was in charge of the investigation of war crimes in the European theater for OSS, uh, I established an office in London on St. James close by British intelligence and was able to obtain incriminating documents in London. This documentary evidence was assembled in Nuremberg in a designated document room. The most incriminating materials were translated and made available to both prosecution and defense counsel. This documents, these documents provided the basis supplemented by the testimony of key witnesses for the entire prosecution case. In his introduction to my book, Tyranny on Trial, uh, published in 1954, only two months before his untimely death, Justice Jackson wrote, Never have the archives of a belligerent nation been so completely exposed as were those of Nazi Germany at the Nuremberg trial. In the preparation, over 100,000 captured documents were screened. About 5,000 were translated, and over 4,000 were used in evidence. 
They were laid out in the courtroom before the very highest of their surviving authors, who with able counsel and first-hand knowledge subjected them to correction, explanation, and attempted justification. The result is a documentation unprecedented in history as to any major war. Our document center received the entire telephonic record of the seizure of Austria by Germany. This was principally conducted by Hermann Goering on the German side and by Seisenquart in Austria. Goering issued final instructions at 8.48 p.m. on March 11, 1938, that Seisenquart should send the following telegram to Berlin. Quote, the provisional Austrian government, which after dismissal of the Schuster government, considered it its task to establish peace and order in Austria, sends to the German government the urgent request for support in its task of preventing bloodshed. For this purpose, it asks the German government to send German troops in as soon as possible. Two days later, Seisenquart signed the law approving the incorporation of Austria into the German Reich. Austria had been taken by telephone and we had the entire record of the conversations to prove it. Case Green was a code name for the seizure of Czechoslovakia. Hitler discussed the proposal to attack this small country at a meeting of his military commanders on November 5, 1937. He observed that once Czechoslovakia had been conquered, Germany could expect a neutral attitude by Poland in case of a German-French conflict. Only the Munich Pact, which Hitler signed with British Prime Minister Chamberlain, saved Czechoslovakia from attack on September 30, 1938. <coughs> but on October 21, 1938, the very day the administration of the Sudetenland was handed over to civilian authorities, pursuant to agreement with the British, Hitler issued a directive, initialed by Keitel, outlining plans for the conquest of the rest of Czechoslovakia. At dawn on March 15, 1939, the German army struck Czechoslovakia from all sides, and Hitler issued a proclamation which stated cynically and succinctly, Czechoslovakia has ceased to exist. The plan for the invasion and subjugation of Poland was perfected under the code name Case White, and it was this act of incendiarism which set the world aflame. All along, Hitler had said publicly that he only wanted the return of Danzig in a motor road across the corridor. But on May 23, 1939, as we were able to prove, he confided his true intentions in a secret conference with his top military commanders. Danzig is not the subject of the dispute at all. It is a question of expanding our living space in the East. There is therefore no question of sparing Poland, and we are left with a decision to attack Poland at the first suitable opportunity. To this end, Soviet Russia had to be neutralized, and suitable explanations offered to Germany's ally Italy. On August 12, 1939, Hitler informed Count Ciano of Germany's decision to attack Poland. But it was the Black Pact the German-Soviet non-aggression pact of August 22, 1939, which made World War II a certainty. We were able to produce this crucial evidence of the agreement in the event of a German attack upon Poland to a partition of Poland leaving to the Soviet Union territories lying to the east of the line of the rivers Vistula, uh, uh, Sun and Bug in Polish territory. It was a tense moment in the courtroom when the evidence of this secret protocol was produced for it marked the certainty of World War II. Indeed, on the very day announcement was made of the pact, Hitler called his top military commanders to over Salzburg, where he gave them their final briefing for the impending war in Europe. We introduced the minutes of these, his remarks. It was clear to me and a conflict with Poland had to come sooner or later. Four days ago, I took a special step 
which brought about Russia's answer yesterday that she is ready to sign. Personal contact with Stalin has been established. The day after tomorrow, Von Ribbentrop will conclude the treaty. Now Poland is in the position in which I wanted her. <coughs> Today's publication of the non-aggression pact with <coughs> Russia has hit like a shell. The consequences cannot be overemphasized. On September 1, 1939, Hitler ordered German armed forces into Poland. Two days later, England and France declared war on Germany. World War II had begun. Stalin, sitting beside his cozy fire in the Kremlin, sipping his vodka, was silent, but not for long. We obtained a copy of the December 18, 1940, top secret Directive number 21, of which only nine copies had been prepared, <coughs> stating that the German armed forces must be prepared to crush Soviet Russia in a quick campaign before the end of the war against England. At 3.30 a.m. on June 22, 1941, German troops began the assault in the east, which led all over the to Germany's defeat in World War II. The record of Hitler's aggression was incredibly complete. We introduced documents of the meetings with his military leaders on his plans to conquer Europe. This record established beyond doubt the crime <coughs> of waging aggressive war. But with respect to war crimes and crimes against humanity, the evidence was not so readily obtainable. In 1939, war, even aggressive war, had not been a judge of crime in international law. But every soldier knew the seriousness of war crimes and crimes against humanity. They were not to be talked about. The Reich's main security officer, RSHA, was the principal Nazi police agency. Op 3 was the SD, or Security Service. It was responsible, responsible for matters of intelligence within Germany. Op 4 was the Gestapo, or Secret Police. The RSHA was the primary repressive agency of the Third Reich under Reinhard Heydrich, and his appointment by Hitler as Reich, until his appointment by Hitler as Reich Protector of Czechoslovakia. Ernst Kosenberg succeeded Heydrich as chief of the RSHA on January 30, 1943, following Heydrich's assassination in Prague. Principally because I had acquired knowledge of the German intelligence system while at OSS, Colonel Story assigned me the case against the Gestapo and SD and the chief of the RSHA, Ernst Kaltenberg. In preparing these cases, I searched through the document room seeking incriminating evidence. One document which I found was a letter written by SS Untersturmfuhrer Becker, the operator of a gas van in the Eastern Territories, to Walter Rauch, the head of the Motor Vehicles Department of the Gestapo, in which he complained of malfunctioning of gas vans under his control, which caused the victims to suffocate and die in agony rather than fall gently to sleep as intended. Shortly before the trial began, I learned that the British had under interrogation in London Otto Oldenborg, the head of Op 3 of the RSHA, which dealt with matters of intelligence within Germany. I asked that the British send Oldenborg to Nuremberg so that I might interrogate him on the organization of the RSHA, of which my defendant, Kaltenberg, was the chief. The British did so, and I began my interrogation of Oldendorf by asking him about his activities during the war. He said that except for 1941, he had served as chief of Op 3 of the RSHA. Naturally, I asked what he had done during that year, when he replied that during 1941, he had been in command of Einsatzgruppe D. I recall the Becker letter, which had been written from an Einsatz command and was inspired to ask, well, Ollendorf, how many men, women, and children did your group kill that year? And he replied, 90,000. That broke the case 
on the extermination program of the Gestapo and SD through the murderous activities of the Einsatzgruppen in the Eastern Territories. And we were able to establish, through the testimony of Ollendorf and others, that approximately two million persons, many Jews, were murdered by these units of the RSHA. It was the initial proof of the Holocaust. In Western Europe, uh, occupied Europe, Hitler ordered killings of a different kind. A unique settlement of claims was achieved by the Nazis in Denmark through the use of murder to offset acts of violence. These transactions were known as clearing murders. For every act against German occupation forces, a secret reprisal action was taken against some day. On December 30, 1943, Hitler called top German officials for a conference in Berlin to consider acts of reprisal against the Danish people. President of the conference, in addition to German officials from occupied Denmark, were Himmler as head of the SS and German police, my defendant Kaltenbrunner as head of the RSHA, and Hitler's principal military advisors, generals Keitel and Jodl, as well as Dr. Werner Best the chief political officer of occupied Denmark, whom I cross-examined at the trial. Best admitted that the decision was reached to counter every act of Danish <laughs> resistance with an act of violence against some prominent Danish person, whether or not involved in the incident. Hitler demanded compensatory murders in the proportion of at least five to one. When I asked Dr. Best whether he knew that, pursuant to the order issued at the conference, clearing murders were carried out in Denmark, he replied, this general fact is known to me, yes. In tyranny on trial is an exhibit taken from the report of Stalin, the chief of Einsatzgruppe A, to Heinrich Himmler, showing that thousands of Jews murdered in the Baltic states by Einsatz Group A. The numbers murdered in each state were enclosed in caskets. Estonia was marked Judenfrei. The victims never received more than a semblance of burial, driven from their homes without cause or explanation. They were taken to the open fields where they were shot and their bleeding corpses thrown into any tank or other ditches. They became notations on the Stalinger report, Jews killed by Einsatzgruppe A in the Baltic states. But of all the evidence produced in the 10 months of the Nuremberg trial on the Holocaust, the unemotional answers of the witness on Oldenburg, Chief of Einsatzgruppe D, to just four questions from the Soviet judge, General Nikochenko, in open court, revealed in chilling reality the truth and barbarity of the Nazi Holocaust. Question. In your testimony, you said that the Einsatz groups had the object of annihilating the Jews and commissars. Is that correct? Answer, yes. Question, and in what category did you consider the children? For what reason were the children massacred? Answer, the order was that the Jewish population should be totally exterminated. Question, including children? Answer, yes. Question. Were all the Jewish children exterminated? Answer, yes. In the beginning, this incredible crime was the responsibility of four Einsatz groups staffed by members of the SD and the Gestapo. These units followed the German armies as they advanced on the Eastern Front, driving Jews from their homes and taking them and other Nazi undesirables into the fields to be murdered. But as the war dragged on, the Nazis found need for permanent installations to house, exploit, 
and ultimately to murder these victims of Nazi insanity. Concentration camps already existed to imprison perceived enemies of the state. Now something more sinister was required. Extermination centers to eradicate the unwanted who had not been killed in the field. The extermination centers were Treblinka, Sobibor, Maidenek, Chelmo, Belzec, and Auschwitz. We continued to find and develop evidence against the defendants as the case progressed. But by the time the prosecution had rested, uh, we still had not found the greatest killer of the regime, Rudolf Hirsch, the commandant of Auschwitz concentration camp. It was therefore a dramatic moment when I was informed that Hearst had been captured by the British near Flensburg. I asked that he be sent to Nuremberg and interrogated him over a period of three days, reducing his testimony <coughs> to an affidavit. Hearst had joined the SS in September 1933 and was proposed by Heinrich Kimmler for concentration camp duty at Dachau the following year. In 1939, he was assigned to Sachsenhausen and in May 1948 was named to command a new quarantine camp to be built near the village of Oswiesum in Holy Silesia with a capacity of 10,000 prisoners. The German name of the new camp was Auschwitz. It was established at the site of a former mil Polish military barracks, and in the beginning most of the prisoners were Polish. In 19 May 1941, Himmler called Hearst to Berlin where he told him that in addition to the war against the Allied powers, Germany was engaged in a secondary struggle with the Jews. Himmler said that if the Jews were not eliminated during the war, they in turn would destroy Germany. And Hearst actually believed this nonsense. He told Hearst that it was his war duty to establish extermination facilities in Auschwitz. Jews were to be sent there by Adolf Eichmann of the Gestapo, <coughs> and it was to be Hearst's responsibility to see that they were destroyed. <coughs> Hearst confessed to me that approximately two and a half million persons had been murdered in Auschwitz. <coughs> Upon completion of his testimony, he was turned over to the Polish government for prosecution. While awaiting trial, Hearst recanted this portion of his testimony in part, stating that the figure he had given me had been supplied by Eisman, and that he regarded the total of two and a half million as far too high. Even Auschwitz had limits to its destructive possibilities, he wrote. Perhaps the figure was inflated. The U.S. Holocaust Memorial estimates that slightly over a million Jews were killed in Auschwitz. In addition, gypsies, Soviet POWs, Jehovah's Witnesses, and others were consumed in the inferno. There may have been a macabre twist to Hearst's testimony, since he was to be labeled the world's greatest uh, supreme murderer in any case. He may have thought in his morbid mind to establish a record of mass killings never to be surpassed by any other man. This seems a reasonable supposition when it is remembered that Eichmann had said that he would jump laughing into his grave, remembering the killing of six million Jews of Europe. An especially dramatic moment in the trial was a cross-examination of Herman Goering by Justice Jackson. Goering had assumed the role of leader of the defendants. He occupied the first seat in the dock. It was therefore of great interest to the press when Goering was cross-examined by Justice Jackson. I was Jackson's assistant and sat beside him at the prosecutor's podium. Among the issues we raised was Goering's role in the terrible pogrom of November 9, 1938, which has come to be known as Crystal Rock, the Night of Shattered Flags. This was a Nazi reaction to the murder of a secretary in the German embassy in Paris by a German Jew named Brinsbeck. During the night, Jewish stores were destroyed throughout Germany. Thousands of Jews were taken into custody and sent to concentration camps, and some were killed. 
Gary met with Hitler and Goebbels to consider further repressive measures. Gary proposed imposing a fine of one billion Reichsmarks upon the Jews whose property had been destroyed, so that all insurance benefits to which they might be entitled would instead be paid to the state. At a meeting in the Reich Air Ministry, Gary declared that Jews should be forced out of the economy. We must agree on a clear action, he said, that will be profitable to the state. And he closed the meeting with these prophetic words. I'd like to say again that I would not like to be a Jew in Germany. If in the near future the German Reich should come into conflict with foreign powers, it goes without saying that we in Germany should, first of all, let it come to a showdown with the Jews. Gehring admitted making these statements, and he did not deny that in a letter dated July 31, 1941, shortly after the invasion of the Soviet Union, he had charged Reinhard Heydrich with a complete solution of the Jewish question in the German sphere of influence in Europe. Some six months before Heydrich disclosed to high-ranking civil servants meeting in a villa at Wannsee, Berlin, that the final solution of the Jewish question was to be, in fact, the extermination of the Jews of Europe. This was the evidence at Norman. In desperate proofs of killings and crimes and wars of aggression, millions of soldiers slaughtered on bloody battlefields, millions of innocents, including mothers and children murdered in extermination center. Nuremberg and other trials and judicial proceedings at the end of World War II established unchallengeable proofs of Nazi military aggressions and related crimes. The task before us, as Henry has just said so brilliantly, is to strengthen the rules law and thereby prevent future wars of aggression, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. That is the mission of Nuremberg.